Hello, dear friends. Today we have a surprise guest with us. This is uh, with Ankita and me. We have Dr. Rishiti Das Gupta. She is a new faculty at Valat, and she has come to Trivandrum to work with us. So, Dr. Rishiti and Ankita, are we ready? Yes, absolutely. Today's practice is for HP set. Okay. There is another surprise. I figured out how to do this <laughs> with the help of our Princey Jha. <laughs> Princey is our technical expert here. Guys, so with all these new developments, are you ready for HP set? Day two, I hope you watched day one. So here comes the first question for you all. Slide is not moving. <laughs> Maybe we should just stick to the old one now. <laughs> Tap on this light, try tapping on this light. Doesn't matter. We'll figure out. Uh, we don't want to bother the YouTubers. <laughs> okay. Sorry for the trouble. Here is your first question. Mirror de l'homme. That is a French title, which has the Latin title Speculum Meditandis. Is an Anglo-Norman poem. Wow, so big, 29,945 lines written in iambic octosyllables. Did you get all the details? Mirror de Lom. It has the Latin title Speculum Meditandis. 14, 29,945 lines in iambic octosyllables. That means eight syllables in a foot. It is tetrameter. So who is the author? Is it William Langland, John Gower, Chaucer or William Dunbar? You two babies, I know you know the answer. Rishiti, can you help our students? Let them try for some time. No? <laughs> <laughs> they are answering. Okay. Are they answering it correctly? It's Gower. John Gower. How many of you know about him? John Gower, everybody knows. Yeah. You do you know he is he was contemporary of Langland and he was Chaucer's friend? Did you know that? Yes, so many of them have answered. You can continue to explain. Ankita? Yes. Or Rishiti, do you have something more? Yeah, his major Latin poem, Vox Clementis, that is also important, and his English work. Confess your mantis, that is also important. Please do keep in mind. Yes. Ankita, there is a book that is dedicated to Gavar. Yes. So Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida, it was dedicated to O Moral Gavar. And the Speculum Meditantis has been written in the manner of a French allegory. That's why this French title is important, Mirror de Lome. It's very important to know the various titles because in exam, we might get confused by the titles and we might think that we have never read about this before. So please read about the various titles of a particular work. Wonderful. So many of them have answered. Congratulations to all of you. Moving on. This is a picture we have here. Look at Vox Clamantis, Speculum Meditantis and Confessio Amantis. And who is this guy sleeping on them? Like you sleep on your encyclopedias. <laughs> okay. Face to Face is the autobiography of Dash. Ruskin Bond, Ved Mehta, Chaman Nahal, or Kushwan Singh. There is a very important information about the author. He had a disability. Isn't it, Rishiti? Yes, ma'am. Can we give them a hint? Uh huh. He didn't have eyesight. He was blind from a very early age. Yes. And I think he's the man who wrote the delinquent cha-cha. 
<laughs> so who is it ankita tell us the answer okay so face to face is the autobiography of ved mehta ved mehta right maria nirmal anakamachi so many people have been answering thank you it is not ruskin bond anakamachi it is ved mehta no problem you can prepare now on him the terms condensation displacement and secondary revision these are terms in literary theory who are they associated with and what are they which theory that is a question is it associated with feminism formalism deconstruction or psychoanalysis rishiti what do you have to say about it people are answering you don't have to worry about that our youtube babies are brilliant wow that's great so the correct answer is psychoanalysis and we all know this term is associated with sigmund freud like he is famous because of psychoanalysis and what is psychoanalysis can someone give a brief overview of it or will ankita give it okay so as far as i know at least uh, freud's psychoanalysis is concerned with the unconscious of human beings and this terms condensation displacement and secondary revision this terms are uh, i mean this terms talk about the dream work according to freud and it talks about how you know our uh, manifest content they become the latent content and all that so can you please talk about i will explain i will explain okay you know things that happen in our real life many things are very hurtful many things are bad our mind does not even want to know that we have these horrible experiences so they are pushed to the back side of the mind they are pushed to the subconscious mind but they stay there it is like the waste basket of the human body the subconscious mind they stay there and they are rotting and they are hurting they have to come out you have to vent them but our conscious mind should not know that these things are there so dreams turn the latent content into manifest content and when the latent content become manifest content they don't come out exactly like that they are either condensed they are either condensed or they are displaced instead of one you see another so dream work is the way in which dreams are formed how they are revising existing material and making new dreams out of it so you see very weird dreams you don't understand what they mean because of these processes condensation displacement secondary revision dramatization there are words like that okay so that is the way to understand so what did dream, uh, sigmund freud do he studied dreams because the dreams are the royal road to the unconscious studying dreams is the way to understand the subconscious mind there is no other way you can understand the subconscious mind you have to study the freudian slips or parapraxis you have to study your mannerisms you have to study the different ways in which the subconscious mind comes out like the steam comes out from a pressure cooker that is the importance of dreams thank you for that question wonderful So next question, Don Juan by Lord Byron is a or an dash. It's a P Y Q. Rushiti, who is the author of Lord, Don Juan? Lord Byron. He's an important romantic poet. Would you like to say something about him? Yes. Uh, can anyone tell me the full name of Lord Byron? I can. <laughs> George Lord, Gordon Byron. Ah, uh, Lord George Gordon Byron. Byron. Yes. so his full name uh, we don't usually use it but that's his full name and uh, he was a romantic like he was a leading fig figure of romantic movement and then one of his very well known work is apart from don juan it's child herald's pilgrimage ankita you would like to add something okay so uh, don juan it's an epic satire by lord byron and it talks about this womanizer lord byron but apart from this womanizer figure here don juan has been presented as a victim to women very interestingly and this was published in uh, 16 cantos and before his death he left the 17th canto unfinished yes 
It was published in 1819, I think. Yes. And yes. Don Juan is actually a Spanish man. In hmm. Spain, he lived. And uh, his story is retold by Byron. Uh, and it is like an allegory. It contains so many other references to society and philosophical ideas. And uh, he was, Lord Byron was a rebel. He rebelled against morality and convention so much. Uh, the Byronic hero we call Don Yuan, you know, who is a rebel. Okay, very good. Uh, sea Grapes is a poem by, is it by the Trinidadian writer Derek Walcott or the Guyanese Canadian writer Cyril Damodine or Lorna Goodison, she's a woman, or E.R. Braithwaite, Braithwaite. Do you know the answer? Sea Grapes. I will tell you the answer. It is by Derek Walcott. Okay, Rishadi and Ankita, you can add more information. Our YouTubers are waiting. Walcott, he was born in St. Lucia. And he has this mixed racial, that his ethnic heritage was that of English, Dutch and African. So he's a complete ju juxtaposition of English, Dutch and African descent. And then his identity actually reflects the complex a complexity within him is reflected in his poems, in his works. And also then he moved to US. So most of his life, he has lived in US. Uh, Ankita, would you like to add something? Okay, so one thing which I found very important about this poem is that this poem contains several references to the Odyssey by Homer. And uh, this uh, poem is a very wonderful poem which talks about his culture his civilization so and it's a very short poem so we can read it once i mean everyone should read it sea grapes uh, a far cry from africa the sea is history mars man adam's song i am just telling you important poems of derek walcott that are prescribed and then dream on monkey mountain is an important play. Pantomime is a play where there are references to Robinson Crusoe. Omeros is a poem that he wrote, rewriting the Iliad. So many important works. Derek Walcott is a sure shot in your exams. Okay. Now we move on to American literature. When lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, is a long poem written by the American poet Dash. Now, I know that all of you know the answer. Our aim is not to test your ignorance. Our aim is to discuss this author, this work. Okay, this is more like a, a teaching session or learning session through questions and answers. So who is the author of When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed? All of you might know it is an elegy to the president. Abraham Lincoln, who had died. Is it Robert Frost, Walt Whitman, William Cullen Bryant, or Ralph Waldo Emerson? Wonderful. People are answering correctly, Rishiti. You can move on and talk about the poet. Walt Whitman, or Walter Whitman, he was the most representative American poet. Other than that, he was also an essayist and journalist. And his famous verse collection, Leaves of Grass, which was published in 18, 18, 1855. It is, as we all know, it's a landmark in the um, history of American literature. And anything else, Ankita? Okay. So, so we know that President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated during the American Civil War, which, was, which started from 1860 and, and ended by 1865. And this war was waged on the issue of slavery. So uh, Abraham Lincoln was anti-slavery. And what is very important in uh, Walt Whitman's poetry is the sense is his romantic sensibility, which is very apparent in almost all of his poems. And uh, when lilacs last in the dooryard bloom is not an exception. His romantic sensibility, the way he mourns for Abraham Lincoln, his language, I think we should read his poetry more so that we can, you know, enjoy these works and understand the context because we know uh, American Renaissance. That's the period when uh, Walt Whitman was writing and that period corresponded or 
almost coincided with english romanticism right so that uh, sense of romanticism romantic sensibility is very much apparent in his writing style as well so yeah i will also add something when lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed he says he saw a western star fall in the sky that he is referring to abraham lincoln and he is writing in long lines which are similar to operatic singing and he is talking about uh, how the death of abraham lincoln impacts on the poor and ordinary people of america when a person dies it is very sad but he is seeing that this sacrifice of a life was very uh hopeful it it gave hope and positivity to the people in america he is uh imagining that the uh, hearse or the funeral procession of abraham lincoln is passing by and he is decorating the coffin with the pictures of ordinary people lilac here represents fresh life from the life of abraham from the death of abraham lincoln fresh life is springing that is the meaning of lilac here and lilac has a deep purple color which is the color of crucifixion that color of dried blood this is a strong image and this is a strong there is a strong underlying current of meaning that is uh, feeding the ideas of democracy and individualism that walt whitman's walt whitman's poetry stands for walt whitman stood for uh, in individualism and democracy which are the pillars of american culture and american literature i am just loving this rishiti and ankita this is so beautiful three of us this is the spirit of valat we uh, do everything collaboratively all our books like the upcoming indian encyclopedia or the quiz program or even our classes everything is a wonderful uh, democratic collaborative sharing uh, where each of us individuals are standing out as important and we have a space but we are also together contributing to the larger cause and it is helping thousands of people out there it's beautiful i and whitman incidentally is my favorite poet okay next question richard steels the conscious lovers is an example of a dash this is a play that was written before a certain tradition started and it is considered the first of that tradition along with colly sibers loves last shift also what is that tradition is it city comedy tragic comedy sentimental comedy or domestic tragedy ankita what is the answer okay so uh, richard steels the conscious lovers it's an example of sentimental comedy it was a middle class reaction against the restoration comedy of manners so restoration comedy uh, was full of very you know uh, sexual intrigue and licentious things but uh, uh, so as a middle class reaction against uh, restoration comedy sentimental comedy believed in the public display of private virtues so i think that's very important rishiti we, i am sure you would like to add uh, something about richard steel steel uh one interesting fact about him is he was anglo irish he was not completely anglo i mean british writer but he was an anglo irish writer and also a playwright and his with his friend joseph addison see addison and steel they always came together it was coupled together for every question like most of the questions so addison and steel they came up with this magazine called the spectator which was very famous at that time and then the periodical that steel himself launched was called the tatler at one point of time they were like the rivals there and he is an essayist dramatist journalist and also a politician who contributed to i mean tatler was about politics right and... yes uh and uh, next question for pepper and christ is a novel by do you know this person he is one of the parsi quartet is it kk and daruwala we know him as a poet did he write a novel is it nasim asakil did was nasim asakil parsi or was he jewish was it domores was domores jewish or parsi or was it give patel mm -hmm. what what is the answer that you go for rishiti it's kk and daruwala yay you can tell us a little more about him 
he's mostly a poet and short story writer but this one is a novel by kk and daruwala so it stands out kind of and a very important fact about him is he was a former police officer indian police office officer and yes he is a parsi ankita okay so this novel for pepper and christ it talks about the time of vasco da gama when the trade for exotic spices was greatly in vogue and and how this trade is getting influenced by christianity so on the one hand we have this a uh, trade for exotic uh, spices which was going on back in the contemporary period of vasco da gama and on the other hand how christianity was spreading so this novel talks about these two things that's great information thank you ankita okay get up stand up is a song by do you recognize this person is 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 it eminem or ed sheeran bob marley or neeraj shridhar they might ask you about music and films and culture popular culture this was a pyq dear friends Ankita, do you have any idea who is the author of yes, this? Yes, it is. It is by Bob Marley. The picture says it all. <laughs> so, Rishiti, can you tell us more about Bob Bob Marley? Yeah, so he is a Jamaican singer, songwriter, and also a guitarist. He is considered as one of the pioneer of this genre, which is which has elements of reggae, ska, and uh, rock steady. then his contribution to jamaican music is very much revered and also he he his career as a i mean as an icon of rastafarian movement that is a social religious movement which has a lot to do with spirituality so he he infused in his music the sense of spiritual spirituality of rastafarian movement and rastafarianism was in jamaica it was well. in jamaica yeah and also there is a lot of rebellion and resistance ingrained in his writing and you can see that in this song itself get up stand up stand up for your rights that's what is written on the screen yes in the castle of my skin is a much acclaimed autobiographical novel by the barbadian writer barbadian matlab he is from barbados in the west indies is it george lamming paul marshall Earl Lovelace or Carol Phillips. Ankita. Yes. So this novel has been written by George Lamming, and it talks about the life of the protagonist G. <laughs> Rishiti. So most of his works are about exile and return, and in this castle of my skin, it draws on his boyhood, his village in the nineteen thirties. It's the story of growing up in. poverty in a co- co- community which is undergoing social changes and it is at the beginning of the uh, west indian immigration and george lamming is also famous for water with berries which is a novel based on the tempest he wrote the pleasures of my exile uh, and uh, of asia the works season of adventure season of adventure he is a later fan. works he was very much obsessed with the prospero caliban syndrome yes that's true and he is a much is a favorite author among net question paper setters mm-hmm. net and set question paper setters thomas grad grind that is not the man in the picture thomas grad grind is a character in the novel dash by charles dickens charles dickens was very intolerant to the new philosophy of utilitarianism which said that no there is no need of imagination there is no need of uh, emotion all we need is the practical approach of the middle classes because utilitarianism looked at uh, the importance of utility of things pragmatic philosophy it was and thomas grad grind stands for such a pragmatic philosophy he fails in that novel which is the novel ankita Okay, so he is the character in uh, Dickens's novel Hard Times, and he is the one who says the very famous opening line of this novel: "Facts alone are wanted in life." So that's facts, a very facts, famous. Facts. That is what I want. He says. <laughs> yes. It's not exactly the opening line. It begins with Coke Town description. 
red bricks of the black and the red bricks of coke town that is what it begins with but in the beginning itself it comes yeah, yeah. and uh, rishiti anything more about dickens or our it's time like dickens's shortest novel and uh, and it, its full title was originally uh, hard times with subtitled as for these times commonly known as hard times now and it is his 10th novel it was first published in 19 uh, sorry 1854 and the book it is it talks it talks about the english society and satire satires the satirizes the social and economic conditions of the era and it is also dickens shortest novel and some and of it is dedicated about... to thomas carlyle who was a co-critic yeah. of utilitarianism and some of other uh, important novels by dickens which are important in net first uh, point of view and even set point of view those are david Cop david copperfield uh, christmas carol bleak house a tale of two cities great expectations and our mutual friend very good yes great the error of evaluating a poem by the emotional effects it produces on the readers what is it called that means you should not judge a poem based on how it affects you emotionally what is the impact of the poem on the reader should not be taken into consideration is it intentional fallacy pathetic fallacy affective fallacy or any other fallacy <laughs> Angita. Yes, it is affective fallacy. Wimsett and Beardsley famously talked about this fallacy, and this concept has been elaborated in their book, The Verbal Icon. Yes. And which larger movement does it belong to? Does it become part of Rishiti? New criticism. New criticism. According to the followers of new criticism, that this is this misconception that arises from judging a po poem by the emotional effect that is produced in among the readers and that is what affective policies uh, talks about the concept that that the direct impact is on i mean it argues that the reader's response to a poem is the ultimate indication of the value of the poem uh affective fallacy is against reader response theory yeah. and affective fallacy upholds the idea that the text is complete in itself that the text is autotelic it should not depend on the author or the reader right the autobiography of my mother is written by again a caribbean writer is it jamaica kincaid olive senior lona goodison or jean rice the autobiography of my mother how can you write the autobiography of your mother that is the trick <laughs> she also wrote uh, annie john lucy ankita is brimming with information to tell us tell us ankita okay so this novel has been written uh, by jamaica kincaid and in this novel we see that the half carib and half scottish african elderly woman zuela claude richardson she narrates her life here looking back over 70 years she says that she lost her mother soon after she was born and she talks about her childhood in this novel and with her life is also intertwined the story or the history of her island dominica and how colonialism affected their lives on the island that's wonderful yes rishiti would you like to add something yeah her original name i mean she was born as elen potter richardson uh, in uh, in antigua but then she chose the name jamaica kincaid and then later she lived in america and most of her works are kind of autobiographical but this one is not an autobiography i mean though the title says so but her novels her major novels have some uh, autobiographical elements in them right that's right Jamaica Kincaid The Moonstone a romance is a 19th century Victorian novel by Wilkie Collins What kind of novel is it Of course it is an epistolary novel that is given in the question Apart from that is it a condition of England novel detective novel silver fork novel or new woman novel The Moonstone if you know the basic conflict in the novel you will understand what it is 
Ankita, would you like to offer some information? Yes. So, uh, The Moonstone by Wilkie Collins, it's an early example of modern detective novel. And the very title itself is a giveaway because this novel uh, revolves around the theft of this moonstone from the bedroom of our protagonist, Rachel Verinda, on her 18th birthday. So that's what this novel is about. And there was a PYQ about this long ago in net. This moonstone was originally stolen from Seringapatam in India, yes. from the head of a deity. And uh, moonstone is not actually uh, properly speaking a detective novel it's a prototype of a detective novel because it's actually a sensation novel and sensation novels led to the genre of detective fiction Wilkie Collins was a friend of our Charles Dickens together they wrote a play The Frozen Deep have you uh, do you have any idea about Wilkie Collins and other works anybody Arishiti would you like the to add Woman in White that is another uh, he is very much known for The Woman in White, which was published in 1859. That's right. And it's a mystery novel. Yes, very good. Yes. The Woman in White and The Moonstone, two important novels of Wilkie Collins, but there are many others. They're all there in our Encyclopedia Volume 3. If you have it, you can take a look at it. Choose the wrongly matched pair. G.V. Desani, All About H. Hatter. Is it correct? Raja Rao, the chess, ma chess master and his moves. Is it correct? Kiran Desai, Nectar in a Sieve. Is it correct? Shashi Deshpande, the dark holes, no terrors. Is it correct? Rishati, our YouTubers are already answering, but you can explain. So the correct answer, I mean. The wrong pair. The wrong answer is Kiran Desai, Nectar in a Sieve. Who has actually written it? It's by Kamala Markandaya, who is an Indian novelist, but she resides in London. And he and she studied at the University of Madras and then worked as a journalist. And in 1948, she settled in England and then she married an Englishman there. And Nectar in a Sieve is her first novel, which was published in 1954. It is about an uh, Indian peasant and her narrative of her difficulty and it remains the most popular work by Markanda. Very good. Did you know guys our uh, Rishati's PhD is in diasporic literature. She's an expert on post-colonial literature. She has already conducted a small course on post-colonial literature at Valat. Right. And she'll be doing more courses for you all. Okay. That is Kamala Markandeya, who wrote Nectar in a Sieve, A Handful of Rice, many novels are there. Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature is a collection of essays about language and its constructive role in national culture, history, and identity. And he talks about the importance of uh, deconstructing English departments, which are obsessed with English language and literature. Well, what happens to African language and literature? Everybody knows who's the, who's the author, I'm sure. Tell us, is it Ngugi Vationgo, Chinua Achibe, Bole Soinka, or Alan Payton? Ankita, your turn. Yes. So this uh, work has been written by Yugi Vationgo. <clears throat> Ngugi Vationgo is a Kenyan writer. Kenyan. Yeah. Rishiti, please give us more information. Earlier, he wrote in English, but then he just wrote in Gikuyu, which is his mother tongue. And he's the founder editor of the Gikuyu language journal called Mutiri. And he has written novels, plays, short stories, critical essays, and even children's book. He embraced the Falunist Marxism and subsequently renounced English and Christianity. And even his name also, uh, that was, I mean, earlier his name was James Googie. Uh, and he renowned, I mean, denounced that and stuck with Googie Vathyongo, his native name, and back to his na native name. And then he began to write in Gikuyu and Swahili as well. That's great information. Yes. Googie Vathyongo. Do you remember some of the novels by Googie Vathyongo? Ankita? We... Ah. A grain of wheat. Weep not, child. 
the, yes, the river between petals of blood. Great. So now we have the famous Canadian writer here wearing her butterfly scarf. In which novel among the following, Snowman, known as Jimmy, is struggling to survive in a world where he may be the last human. It is a dystopian world because of a biological disaster. Everybody has died. Only Jimmy or Snowman is remaining. And later we know that it is his own friend who created that biological disaster. So which is his novel? Is it Oryx and Crake surfacing the blind assassin or Alias Grace? Ankita? Yes, it is um, the novel Oryx and Crake. And this novel is actually part of a dystopian trilogy by Margaret Atwood. But the other two novels are The Year of the Flood and The Mad Adam. And this Oryx and Crake talks about this character Snowman. where he And this novel talks about his struggle to survive in this dy dystopian world where he thinks that he may be the last human here. Dang, Rishati, your turn. And apart from being an author, she's also an environmental act activist and she's best known for her prose fiction and for her feminist writings. And her first novel was called The Edible Woman, published in 1969. In that, the protagonist is a, this lady, Marian McAlpin, and she develops this peculiar inability to consume food. And apart from uh, that, uh, she was, I mean, Atwood was also a Booker Prize winner in 2000 for The Blind Assassin and in 2019 for The Testament. And The Testaments is a sequel to The Handmaid's Tale. It's true. And that is many true. of her works were actually uh, made into a TV series or movie. Yes. You must have watched Handmaid's Tale series, Alias Grace series. Alias Grace. Stocky and Co. is a novel by Dash about adolescent boys in a British boarding school. Stocky and Co. Have you heard that? Is it H.G. Wells, George Orwell, Rudyard Kipling or Graham Greene? Ankita Ganguly is the one who is telling us the answer. Okay. So, Stocky and Co. It's a novel by Rudyard Kipling about adolescent boys at a British uh, boarding school. And here in this novel, we see three juvenile protagonists who are like, you know, they're teenage boys and they have this know-it-all type of attitude. And uh, this uh, novel was first published in 1899. And it appeared in many magazines during uh, those years. And it is set at a school dubbed the college or the call. The school itself is called the college, which is based on the actual United Services College that, that uh, Kipling had attended as a boy. Wow. Minor, so-called minor works of major authors, remember, are very important in the exam. Dushati is going to tell us more about Rudyard Kipling now. Kipling was born in Mumbai and his life in India, he was greatly inspired by them. And I'm sure you all know about the Jungle Book, his famous duology of Jungle Book 1 and Second Jungle Book. And it is about India. So India has been a great inspiration for Kipling. And uh, if his poem, If, is also a very important poem, which you can look up and read about. And it. White Man's Burden. And White Man's Pardon. Oh my God, that is like the major work. And yeah, again. Right. Yes. And he got the Nobel Prize in 1907. Seven, yes. Mr. Adolf Verlock is a spy. And he's the protagonist in which novel of Joseph Conrad? Nostromo, The Secret Agent. Will there be a spy in The Secret Agent? The Lagoon. Or the shadow line. Are nahi, shadow lines nahi. That is Amit of Ghosh. This is the shadow line. So which is the novel with a spy? Mr. Verlock. Angita? Yes. So we see Mr. Adolf Verlock as a secret agent. In the novel, The Secret Agent. And one very... Uh, an other than this theme of espionage and terrorism, one another very important aspect of this novel is Adolf's relation with his brother-in-law, Stevie, who is suffering from autism and how uh, Mr. Adolf reacts to that. 
so that relationship between them is very important wow that's good information ankita okay the defense of the seven sacraments assertio septum sacramentorum is a theological treatise published in 1521 written by king dash this is the famous king uh, who brought right after this reformation this is even if you don't know anything about all this 1521 and uh, you can guess because right after that who lived uh, allegedly with the assistance of sir thomas more is it henry the 5th in 1535 he brought reformation is it henry the 5th henry the 8th james the 1st or james the 2nd angeline anakamachi sunanda gokula anitesh tell us the answer shrabani mm -hmm. they're all actively answering okay ankita your turn yes so this theological treatise has been written by henry 8 Anything more, Rishiti? I'll talk about Thomas More. Yes. Yeah, and then he was an English lawyer, judge, and social philosopher. Apart from being author, statesman, and he also served Henry the Eighth as Lord High Chancellor of England from uh, October fifteen twenty nine to May fifteen thirty two. And he his work Utopia is another famous work which was published in fifteen sixteen, which describes the political system of an imagine imaginary island state. Wow, I didn't know that one. So that brings us to this amazing discussion end. I hope you loved it. I hope you enjoyed it. Please join us every day at nine pm for a feast of knowledge and lots of amazing discussions and perspectives, combining history and literature with theory and so many wonderful things. And I would also like to remind you that our six month batch course admission is going to end, and we have a quiz program running. There is a hybrid course starting at Ernakulam and online. So, if you need information on any of these, please do contact us. Okay, our uh, numbers and all contact information is there in the description of the video. Please like the video and subscribe and press the bell icon if you like what we are doing for you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful, peaceful night. Bye bye from me, Ankita and Rishiti. <laughs>